welcome back to another episode for English 9 for the week of June 8th. This is Carrie Lockery, a resource teacher with the Office of Secondary English Language Arts. It will be helpful if you gather all the materials for Lesson 1 and Lesson 2 before we begin. We have three goals for Lesson 1 and two goals for Lesson 2. For Lesson 1, I can analyze the influence of Pyramus and Thisbe on William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. I can analyze similarities and differences between Romeo and Juliet and Pyramus and Thisbe. And finally, I can gather ideas to analyze a universal theme that is still relevant today. For lesson two, I can write an argument to support a claim about a theme in Romeo and Juliet that's still relevant today. And secondly, I can use valid reasoning and relevant and sufficient evidence to support my claim. Before we dive into Pyramus and Thisbe, let's learn about Ovid. On March 20th, 43 BC, Publius Ovidius Nasso, better known to modern readers as Ovid, was born in Somo, 90 miles from Rome. Ovid's father expected him to become a lawyer and official and had him schooled extensively for that purpose. After working in various judicial posts, Ovid made the decision to dedicate himself to a life of poetry instead. Ovid's elegance made him a favorite among the money class of Rome, and it was not long before Ovid was widely hailed as the most brilliant poet of his generation. The reason for Ovid's exile by Augustus is unknown. What is certain is that in AD 8, Ovid was sent to the bleak fishing village of Tomi for what he describes as a poem and a mistake. Ovid attempted on numerous occasions to find his way back into the good graces of Augustus, writing poems to the emperor and other influential friends. The poems, which were far less polished and elegant than his previous works, had little effect on Augustus, and Ovid remained in exile until his death in AD 17. His most famous work, The Metamorphosis, which he wrote in AD 8, had a great influence upon writers of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, and the 12th century was named the Ovidian Age for the numerous poets writing in Ovidian hexameter. We know that Ovid had an incredible influence on William Shakespeare. Pyramus and Thisbe are two young lovers featured in an ancient Babylonian story recounted in the Metamorphosis of the Roman poet Ovid. Their parents occupied adjacent houses, and the young people fell in love, but their parents forbade them to marry. The lovers held whispered conversations through a crack in the wall between their houses. Finally, they decided to meet at the tomb of Ninus under a white mulberry tree. Arriving first, Thisbe saw a lion with jaws bloody from a recent kill. Fleeing, the maiden dropped her veil, which the lion tore in its bloody mouth. When Pyramus came, he saw the bloody veil, and believing Thisbe dead, plunged his sword into his side. His blood spurted upward, staining the white mulberries. Thisbe found him dying and stabbed herself. Ever since, the mulberry has been purple. Shakespeare included a travesty of the story in A Midsummer Night's Dream and uses similar details and themes about love in Romeo and Juliet. For Try It, you will read Pyramus and Thisbe. If you are following the print pathway, the story is included in your resources. If you are following the digital pathway, you can access the story and collections on pages 283 through 287 or through Discovery Education. For both of these resources, remember that you must be logged into Schoology before you can access them, and it's recommended that you read them in a separate tab. For both collections and Discovery Education, you may listen to the text as you follow along. You can also annotate and take notes in the text. Discovery Education offers a synopsis as well. There is a graphic organizer located in your resources. When you open the graphic organizer, compare Pyramus and Thisbe to 
to Romeo and Juliet. See how many similarities you can find. The real question is understanding the impact one story can have on a writer. Ovid so impacted Shakespeare that he wrote not one, but two different plays incorporating Pyramus and Thisbe. So what messages did Shakespeare absorb that influenced him so much? Access the graphic organizer to brainstorm some ideas about universal themes in both Pyramus and Thisbe and Romeo and Juliet. You will also take some notes on setting, character, and plot. Since you tuned in, you have exclusive access to some examples of theme statements. There are many possible answers to the hint questions in your graphic organizer. Here are just some examples that might help your writing for lesson two. Forbidden love can grow in the midst of adversity. Love is an overwhelming force that overtakes all other beliefs, loyalties, and emotions. Which of the following best applies to both stories? Children should always obey their parents, or to come of age means to question the judgment of parents. You may not even agree with both of these theme statements, but hopefully you can see how they both show up in each story. Which of the following best applies to both stories? Fate will always govern a person's actions, or outcomes in life are a combination of fate and free will. Broken communication always produces conflict. And finally, is the message about death negative or positive? Societal violence impacts all people. This is a realistic, or negative perspective. Death has the power to change. This is a positive and hopeful perspective. Here are some reminders about writing that will help you in lesson two. Include an introduction. Usually the very last sentence is your thesis or what you will prove in your writing. See more information about this and try it. Separate your ideas into individual paragraphs. Each paragraph should develop only one idea. Each paragraph should also include textual support from both Pyramus and Thisbe, as well as Romeo and Juliet. Incorporate textual evidence from both stories that proves that your ideas about the universal theme are true. Also, your ability to explain the connection between the text evidence and the universal theme will help your reader understand your points that you are trying to prove. This is your analysis. Be sure to choose the best textual evidence. Transitions are essential for coherent writing. They allow the reader to logically and smoothly move from one idea to the next. Some words and phrases that help begin a transition include also, furthermore, on the other hand, for example, in the same way, in other words, etc. The conclusion should not restate or summarize the thesis statement from the introduction. The conclusion should connect the importance and relevance of the universal theme with the life of the reader. Remind the reader why the universal theme is the most relevant in today's world in comparison with other themes represented in both stories. So let's try it. This is the most important part of any well-written essay, usually limited to one or two sentences. The thesis statement is the main idea or topic of an essay. An essay without a strong and clearly defined thesis statement is like a ship without a captain or a rudder the essay will drift aimlessly without clear direction. The thesis statement is the leader of the essay because every sentence written thereafter is to either directly or indirectly support it. Before one ever begins writing, one must come up with a solid and clear thesis statement. You may have heard this called the claim when writing an argument. 
it is usually placed early in the text in the first paragraph. The first paragraph is called the introduction paragraph because it introduces the topic of the essay. The introduction should include a hook to get your reader's attention. Who is your audience? What do they care about? Write your introduction and thesis statement to respond to the prompt. Considering the fact that Romeo and Juliet is a play, while Pyramus and Thisbe is a narrative poem, write an essay using evidence from both texts that analyzes a universal theme or message that is still relevant today. Don't forget to use your resources that you created for Show What You Know from Lesson 1 to help you. Right, here's your chance to show what you know. Remember, you are going to write a well-developed essay that responds to all parts of the prompt. Be sure that you choose a universal theme that's present in both stories. And be sure that that universal theme is one that you believe is truly the most relevant today. Don't forget to include text evidence from both stories. The scoring guide in the digital pathway provides a checklist of all the necessary parts of your essay. It also includes a rubric. I highly recommend that you score yourself using the rubric before you submit your work. And remember, all good writers ask others for feedback. And while that might be intimidating, it's always helpful to have someone else read your work and give you some pointers and ideas to make sure your message and claim is clear. Check with your teacher to see if you're able to revise your writing before submitting a final draft. Thanks for tuning in. Until next time. Hi, thanks for joining me. This lesson is for GT9 English, the week of June 8th, and it connects to lesson two. We're going to review first draft compositions. We're going to wrap up our discussion on the nature of human nature, and all of this inspired by our friend, Mr. William Golding. Let's get started. We've discussed before that first draft compositions are writing tasks, and they're writing tasks that are done one time. One draft, no rough copy, no final, no revision is expected for these tasks. Because of that, and because nobody's perfect, you're bound to have minor errors in your writing. Those minor errors do not detract from the score that you'll receive for this first draft composition. The one exception is if your errors interfere with what you're trying to say. If your reader, in this case your teacher, can't understand what you're saying, then that will mean your score is lowered. But if it's just the odd spelling or grammatical mistake, not to worry. Just like other writing tasks, first draft compositions have a clear thesis, they're well organized, and they have examples and analysis which support your thesis. So those bullets are gonna be what we spend our time learning about today. How is it that you can do the best job on this first draft composition and finish the year strong? What you need to be certain that you do is that you write a strong, effective thesis statement because that's gonna drive all of your work as you go through this assignment. Now, your thesis has to do a couple of things. It certainly has to respond to the prompt and it has to give your response to what you're writing about. And importantly for this particular assignment, it needs to identify the work that you're discussing. And that's because you have the choice of any text that you've read this year, you wanna be sure to make a clear statement of what text you're discussing so that your reader, teacher, will be able to follow along with you. Okay, so what are we writing about? Let's look at the prompt. Consider this quote from William Golding. The moral of Lord of the Flies is that the shape of a society must depend on the ethical nature of the individual and not on any political system, however apparently logical or respectable. Choose one other work that you read this year and explain how this moral applies to the new text. Use examples from the text to support your answer. My attention is grabbed right here by this word moral. 
And morals are different from themes. The theme is the message of the author. The moral is really a teaching moment. It's gonna be something that is really deliberately designed as a lesson. So what is it that we're supposed to learn out of the lesson of Lord of the Flies? Well, it's that the shape of society must depend on the ethical nature of people. So let's think about what's innate. Let's think about what people do. Are we doing the right thing? Is that what people are kind of built to do? Or is it that we need those systems, whether it's laws or leaders or courts or the idea of crime and punishment, is that what we need for society? So Golding is saying that, no, nope, we have to depend on people. To what degree would your other authors consider this? Are they in agreement that, no, it's all about people? Or will they make a case that those systems, though they are imperfect, that that's what we need to shape a society? Now, really key is you have to just choose one work. In ninth grade, you've read so many interesting texts, and in a lot of ways, all of them work for this assignment. So think about the one that you know the best, think about the one that you remember the most about, and the one that you think makes the strongest case in response to this prompt. So thinking back to the chart that you did in the last lesson, how is it that these works fit? And do they prove Golding or disprove Golding? So what would Harper Lee say about the idea of society and the nature of individuals? Does she think that society and the shape of our society depends on everybody doing the right thing? Or is there some sense that the systems that we have work and that they're important in, let's think of it in terms of like kind of forcing people to do the right thing? What about March? John Lewis is certainly writing and working and speaking to change systems. So is he counting on people to make imperfect systems or do we need the systems to do the right thing for the people? What does Octavia Butler think? She has, in her story, been able to look at these ideas from perspectives about 200 years apart. So what is it that she's teaching us by these lessons and constantly revisiting our past? Are we making changes? Are we doing things better? Is it people or is it systems? What would Shakespeare say about this? I think one of the reasons we still read Shakespeare now is because of his incredible understanding of human nature. So how would he respond to William Golding? And then lastly, thinking about Homer and the Odyssey, epic poems are written to show people how to be the best people for that society and to live up to those values. So what would Homer do in response to Golding's quote? As ever, it's important to understand the rubric that you're gonna be scored by. This rubric comes from the AP Language and Composition exam, and it's their new rubric. It's divided into three parts, and we're gonna take a look at those parts one by one. The first is our friend the thesis statement, and please notice it's an all or nothing category. You need to have a strong thesis or you don't get the point. So what does that mean? You have a thesis that responds to the prompt. Can't say it enough. Stick to the question, answer what you're asked. And your thesis presents a defensible position. I want you to think about this in two ways, because I think that this idea of a defensible position is really interesting. The first is that your position can be supported with text evidence and analysis. So important. If you can't prove it in the text, how are you making a valid point? The second way I want you to be thinking about defensible positions 
is that somebody can argue the opposite of what you're saying. A good thesis statement does tackle an essay that's thoughtful and interesting enough that someone should be able to disagree with you and make an equally good case. So as you're writing your thesis statements, try to do both of those. All right, if you don't have a thesis, forget it. Don't just restate the prompt, give your argument, make your point and show how you're gonna prove it. Just a summary, Ugh, we've all read these texts. And if you go off in some crazy direction and you don't respond to the prompt, no points. Let's live over here, grab that thesis statement point. The second section is about evidence and commentary, and you'll notice that this is a scale now of zero to four points. You know I hate talking about the zeros and the ones. I'm crossing those out right now. So let's think about how you can get all of your points. Well, first of all, let's consider evidence. There's specific evidence, so not talking about something that's part of the overall scope of the book, but referring to really specific moments within those texts. They do not, and in this case, probably should not be word for word, but you're gonna give a reference to a very specific moment in time and place in that book. And because you have a really cohesive essay, one that really sticks together, that evidence is gonna support all your claims in the line of reasoning. Because your reasoning should be logical, so too can the evidence that supports it. And then remember, here's your analysis. It consistently, explains your evidence. Sew that circle tightly back. Use your analysis to explain your evidence and how that evidence supports your thesis. When you're always going back in that tight set of circles, you're gonna be doing a top-notch job. All right, what's different in if you only earn three points? Well, nothing is different in evidence. It's specific evidence that supports all your claims. But under commentary, now you're only explaining some of the evidence and how it supports your thesis. Especially in a writing assignment that is as short as this one will be, only put in the best pieces of evidence and explain all of them. Don't give up this point because you've missed out on a couple. Two points starts to be really different. Now you only have some specific evidence maybe not all of it is relevant and is going to make your point really again that's i keep going back that's pre-writing have you chosen the best examples that make your point in the best way your commentary or your analysis you only explain some of it you don't really establish a clear line of reasoning you don't make it clear what you're trying to prove and what your opinion is and then how all of this works together to show you're right or you're just making a case that isn't correct. Let's avoid all that. The last section is about sophistication in your writing. And we're back to an all or nothing category. In this section, think about how you create your own voice as a writer. Think about the rhetorical strategies that you're going to use because you're creating your own rhetorical situation by writing this first draft composition. Now, I also want you to think about this in terms of what the book is doing and how well you manage that. Because the first part of this rubric sections asks you to look at the sophistication of thought. Certainly, how is it that you are analyzing these texts? Are you doing more than just a really superficial job? but are you really digging into the nuanced messages? All of these are full length texts. And as we've talked about in other lessons, writers have more than one theme and those themes are also sophisticated. So do you understand that? And are you explaining that in your own thoughtful, sophisticated way? And you have really, you're demonstrating your understanding of those complexities about the answers that were given, about the questions that were asked, about the degree to which we have answers. You're also, again, understanding those rhetorical situations. A graphic memoir for March, a prose novel for Kindred and Mockingbird, a play for Romeo and Juliet, an epic poem for the Odyssey. 
So how do those structures influence what happens? And then also, are you in writing your own complexities into your rhetorical situation of this first draft composition? Let's grab that point too. So to finish up, it's time to write. This is one of the very last things you're writing for GT9 English, so make it great. Focus on just one work. Stick to what the prompt is asking. Live in that quote for William Golding. Strong examples from the text are absolutely necessary, though it's not necessary to quote them word for word. Think about all you've learned about writing, about writing skills, about organization, about having your own strong voice, and then go out there and do an awesome job. Good luck, everybody.